Yeah. All right. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this Tuesday, March the 21st public meeting of the Board of Garrett County Commissioners. I want to welcome a full house here uh, in the courthouse and anyone watching at home. Uh, if everyone would please stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. And Commissioner Tishnell will lead us in the invocation. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If you bow with me for a word of prayer. Precious and loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. Lord, we thank you for each and every person that made the effort to come out here today. And and we, we ask that you be with us and guide us and direct us through this meeting. And that everything that we say and do here today is pleasing to you. And Lord, we'll just continue to praise you and glorify you. We do all this in thy precious holy name. Amen. Please be seated. Mr. Nall, any additions, corrections, public meeting agenda? No, sir, there are none. Hearing none, do we have a motion to approve the meeting agenda? Motion to approve. We have a motion and a second. Second. A motion and a second. Uh, agenda approved by mutual consent. Everybody got a copy of the minutes in advance of the meeting. Are there any additions, corrections, or concerns to the minutes? Hearing none, do we have a motion to approve? So moved. We have a motion, we have a second. Second. A motion and a second. Minutes are approved by mutual consent. <clears throat> The very first item on the agenda, I think probably the reason most of you are here, Absolutely. is to uh, recognize a great Garrett County long-term business, uh, All Earth Eco Tours. And uh, with that, Connor Norman from Economic Development, uh, I'll call him up and turn it over to him. All right, thank you, Paul. <clears throat> And I know I say this every meeting, but, you know, I am excited every time we do one of these milestone celebrations. And this time we're doing it for a business that has been active in our community for 30 years. Championing, 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 I can't talk today. Mark that down. That's a first. Uh, so, yes, I want to welcome all of you that are here regularly, those watching online and the town of Friendsville here today. Uh, it is an exciting and auspicious occasion. We are recognizing All Earth Eco Tours for 30 years and their tremendous contribution to this community. You can see around examples of their work. We actually have these three easels uh, that uh, sport some of that fantastic artwork that both Creed and Carol have been responsible for, uh, again, through these past 30 years. Uh, Carol, we're gonna bring you up here and present you a proclamation. Again, just thanking you and honoring you guys for your contribution to our community. Paul, would you like to uh, say if you are read that proclamation? Absolutely, be my pleasure. Carol, why don't you come on up? Yeah, come on. Okay. So it is my pleasure on March 21st, 2023, to offer this Board of Garrett County Commissioner's commendation to All Earth Eco Tours on her 30th anniversary. We, the Board of County Commissioners of Garrett County, Maryland, and our citizens are happy to join together to extend our sincerest congratulations to All Earth Eco Tours on its 30th anniversary. Since 1993, All Earth Eco Tours and the Calhoun family have helped our citizens and visitors explore, cherish, capture, and share the beauty of Garrett County with the world. Their efforts in outdoor advocacy, preservation, and recreational entrepreneurship have helped contribute to a legacy that future generations will continue to enjoy for years to come. Congratulations to All Earth Eco Tours on this milestone and the exemplary work and professionalism of the past 30 years. May these years be an inspiration for continued success. Signed by Commissioners Titchnell, Savage, and myself. And Carol, congratulations. <clears throat> Sure. And if we could have our economic development staff, and we're joined here by the mayor of Friendsville, if we could have them join us up here. Thanks. Come on up. Thank you with my girl over there. Come on down, Spence. Thanks, Spence. You get over here, Derek. He's thinning up a little bit. 
Spencer Ward. We're very proud of him. He's getting cut off now. Where are we looking? Over <laughs> there. Oh. Okay. Before I open up the floor to Carol, I want to let everybody know that right outside the door here, we do have further displays. That whole table, please go and check that out. Uh, it is, again, a tremendous snapshot of our businesses and our local community captured through the art of that Calhouns. Please go out there and check that out. Right here, I'm holding uh, the Sacred Bonfire uh, little book. This is the first time I met the Calhouns around this campfire. And let me tell you, I'm, I'm going to tell you all about it. So meet me out there. Uh, it was a fun experience, and uh, maybe one day we'll see it again here. But, Carol, I'm going to open the floor to you. Say a few words. Okay. Um, can I get my speech? <laughs> no, I wrote no, a speech. No. <laughs> and I need to actually read it. Absolutely. There we are. Okay, so, and then if I break down, she has to take a I first came to this area 33 years ago to go whitewater rafting on the Cheat River in West Virginia. It was there I met and, oh. and fell in love with the man who would become my husband, Creek Calhoun. He was already an accomplished outdoorsman by then, a rip and telemark skier, an excellent photographer, and was working at promoting Garrett County by writing articles for magazines producing print advertising pieces for local businesses and providing creative imagery uh, for the Garrett County Deep Creek Lake Visitor's Guide. His photos have been published in many magazines, including National Geographic, Outside, Ski, and more. His nature art prints are displayed in many homes and offices throughout Garrett County and beyond, including two large installations at the BWI airport. He had a gift his ability to capture light was magical. Got this. He was able to transfer his love of nature into the camera and onto the page. He spent decades capturing images of what he loved most. Our love affair with each other and this county was a long one. And for me, it continues. I feel a little like the words in the John Denver song. I was born in the summer of my 27th year, coming home to a place I'd never been before. Because I fell in love not just with my husband, but also with this place and the natural beauty that surrounds us here. Soon after we married, we bought our house in Friendsville. We worked together in our photography design business, which is where most of these brochures came from, and opened the Windrush Gallery, which was fun and successful. And then we were, when we were about to have our daughter Kaylee, we decided it was time to go back outside again <coughs> to answer our calling and help people experience nature in a safe and relaxing way so that they too might love and want to protect the wild things. And so we began all Earth Ego Tours, and for the last 24 years, our business has been longer, but this part, we have been doing just that, getting people out into nature and exploring some of the more remote, off-the-beaten path areas of Garrett County. We carved out a nice niche in the kinder, gentler area of outdoor adventure with our signature flatwater kayak tours on the Savage River Reservoir, guided walks and hikes, team building, farm tours, yoga, and nature programs. We partner with other professionals and businesses for some of our programs like Yoga to You, our very popular farm camp with the Dubanskis out at the Backbone Farm, our Snakes and Salamanders hike with the Feral Nut, and our Birds of Prey program with Darren and Sherry Meter. We have worked with many groups over the years from family and friends getaways to schools and corporations. Our bonfire extravaganza <laughs> attracted hundreds of people each summer while we offered it to come and sing and dance, have their faces painted, <coughs> roast marshmallows, tear up their cool cards, and listen to the stories of the animals and why our connection to all things is important to remember. This was our most personal offering. Because the message for the environment and its need to be protected was so strong, we felt that it needed to be heard, and to be heard, 
It had to be delivered in a fun and interactive way that kids could understand and take with them. In that, I believe we were successful. <coughs> we had families return year after year, some scheduling their vacations around it. As a matter of fact, we still get calls for it. People still remember it. <laughs> some fun. even still ask <laughs> if we could maybe just do one more, a special <coughs> one somewhere. And well, the While the bonfire extravaganza is not possible without Creed, his legacy, our dream, lives on. I will be continuing with All Earth, offering our kayak tours and special programs that have become such a big part of Garrett County. And our daughter, along with her husband, will continue to be Garrett Countyans too. Our daughter Kaylee has opened her own business and formed an LLC, CB Trains, a dog training boarding school. She boards the dog she trains and also finds time to help with dog and cat rescue too. She has been a big part of our community for a long time and now her husband Jose is too. He was recruited by Garrett College from Venezuela to play baseball and will soon be finishing up his degree in computer science at WVU. He was offered a job in his field which begins immediately upon graduating. As young newlyweds, they are planning their future, and they would like it to be based in Friendsville. Kaylee's ties run deep, and Jose loves living in a town that is small enough and safe enough for kids to walk to school. He loves hearing them in the morning and looks forward to having kids walk to school, too. Friendsville has a remarkable school, and we are hoping we can keep it as it is so vital to the health of our community. I am grateful for this recognition, for my family and friends, for this beautiful place and the opportunities to be found here. Thank you, Thank you very much, Carol, and uh, I'll second uh, what Connor said, everyone. Uh, feel free to step out and take a look at the display outside and the displays in here as well. Once again, <laughs> Carol, congratulations. Thank you very much. Best of luck on another 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is uh, a bid award from the purchasing division. Mr. Nall, what do you have for us? Oh, yes, sir. So this is a uh, proposal number 23-0117. This is for the development of a renewable gas, uh, gas project at the Garrett County Landfill. This project is to capture, clean, and recycle methane gas from the landfill. Uh, three responses were received. Northern Biogas. Uh, Hunt, Goliath, and Associates, and Archie <coughs> Energy. Uh, the proposals were, were evaluated based on three key qualifications, past project history, uh, and proposed uh, financial model. Uh, so this project will, uh, it's no cost to the county. Um, there is a potential revenue stream depending on the quality and quantity of gas. Uh, so based on the analysis uh, of the proposals, the recommendation is to award uh, bid, uh, award the proposal 23-0117 to Archia Energy. Any questions for Mr. Nall? It's a great project. Uh, once again, basically to summarize, uh, the project will take the methane gas that's already at the landfill, capture it, clean it, uh, sell it to Columbia Gas, in which case the county will get a percentage of that back. It's no cost to the county to implement this. Uh, could be a substantial revenue stream over time. Could be a minimal one. We'll just have to wait and see. Seems like a no-brainer. I commend the work on this from the staff that put this together. 
Uh, do we have a, uh, a motion to accept bid number 23-0117 to Archea Energy uh, for the landfill project? So, so we have a motion, we have a second. Okay. Motion a second. Question with motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries. Next item on the agenda is a uh, resolution 2023-1 uh, uh, for Garrett County government to purchase lot one of the McHenry Business Park. Resolution number 2023-1, a resolution of the Board of County Commissioners of Garrett County, Maryland, a body politic and corporate and a political subdivision of the state of Maryland known as the county authorizing the county to purchase certain real property known as lot number one in the McHenry Business Park, also known as 46 Business Park Drive, Accident, Maryland, 21520, consisting of 7.48 acres, more or less, situated in election district number six, Garrett County, Maryland, as shown on a plat recorded in plat case TWM2 at page 877. Among the plat records of Garrett County, Maryland, a copy of which plat is attached hereto and made part hereof from the Maryland Economic Development Corporation, known as Medco, for a purchase price of $1,500,000. The purchase price authorizing the county to pay the purchase price to Medco and directing the appropriate and directing the appropriate chairman of the Board of County Commissioners for Garrett County, Maryland to execute any and all documents as may be necessary to effect the purchase of the property from Medco. Simplifying uh, what this resolution does is allow the county to purchase the shell building in the McHenry Business Park from the state at a discounted rate to which we will end up selling it to a potential client a uh, little inside baseball, be tuned in Thursday for a very exciting announcement, uh, which will uh, generate a lot of jobs for, uh, for the county. So more to come on that, but what this resolution does is allow us to purchase the, the property, the building at a discounted rate from the state so that we can control it and we can uh, facilitate the sale of it. Do I have a motion to approve resolution 2023-1? Motion to approve. We have a motion, we have a second. Second. Motion and a second, question on the motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next item of business on the agenda is resolution 2023-2, which is the approval of the Garrett County Water and Sewer Master Plan amendments. Uh, those of you that tuned in last week uh, or last meeting, I'm sorry, uh, we had a public hearing on the uh, amendment to the Master Water and Sewer Plan. We held a comment period open for two weeks, in which time we received zero comments on the proposed amendments to the plan. Resolution number 23-2 states resolution of the body of the county commissioners of Garrett County, Maryland, a body politic and corporate and political subdivision of the state of Maryland known as the county, approving the proposed change of the 2014 Garrett County Water and Sewerage Plan pursuant to the requirements of Code of Maryland Regulations, Title 26, Subtitle 3, Water Supply, Sewerage, Solid Waste and Pollution Control, Planning and Funding in Title 9, Subtitle 5, the Environment Article, the Antate Code of Maryland, Water and Sewerage plans. Um, again, the, the total plan uh, is on the website. It was presented last week. Uh, no comments were made. Do I have a motion to uh, accept resolution number 23-2? Motion to accept. We have a motion to approve. We have a second. Second. Motion and a second. Question on the motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next item on the agenda, uh, we have a presentation uh, from Garrett County Community Action uh, Transit Service, the Maryland Annual Transportation Plan Fiscal Year 2024 Grant Update by Mr. One and Only Mike Hill. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And thanks for that introduction, Paul. I don't know about the one and only part, if that's good or bad, but but we'll go with that. And I, I appreciate you guys 
you know, having me today. Uh, I will keep this brief because my voice, I don't know how long that'll last. I've only been fighting this for a month or so, so I don't know why, you know, I would still have it. But um, I wanted to do a quick update um, of our, as Paul said, our annual transportation plan grant, like our main grant that we submit every year. I haven't been able to you know, come before you guys for a couple of years here because of COVID, everybody knows. And there wasn't, you know, the public meetings, but um, we were able, just to update everybody real quick, we were able to run every day uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, you know, no one, we didn't have a work from home option, you know, with drivers and all that. So we, we were there every day. Um, we did, obviously, things dropped off as far as ridership um, and employees. Um, you know, it all kind of kind of went together. Um, we dropped off nearly 60% of ridership uh, in the you know the early parts of of COVID or you know 20 year 2020. But we are seeing that rebound now uh, as far as ridership and employees, which I know everybody that you hear talking about employees, it's a tough it's a tough thing to find. But uh, we lost a few because of COVID that, you know, just didn't want to work in that situation. We had some retirements, we had some other things just by attrition, but, and it's been slow to get that back, but we are, we are doing that right now. Um, we're back up to 26 employees. We were down as low as, you know, 18 or 20, uh, at least for a while. Uh, we have 18 drivers now, about 15 of those, I believe, are full-time. I have the have all these numbers here in front of me, but yeah, 15 full-time drivers, which we are keeping busy now because as I said, ridership is building back up. Um, as far as our budget goes, uh, every year is nearly a $1.4 million budget is about the, the ballpark figure that, that we're looking at. Um, it will be a little higher this year uh, due to the fact that I'm putting in for three new buses this year <clears throat> that I haven't done for a couple years due to the fact we just didn't have the, the uh, drivers, didn't, you know, didn't have the ridership. We were actually, uh, the Maryland Transit Administration, they like to look at numbers as far as um, spare ratio on buses. We were up, I think at the end of 2020, starting in 2021, we were up to 80% spare ratio on buses. And they they don't like that, but they knew, you know, the situation, they knew why. We just lost drivers. We had a lot of new buses that we just received in the previous couple of years. Now we're down back, or, you know, back down to about 10, 15%, which is what they're looking for. So I am gonna put in for three buses this year, um, along with the operating um, budget about a little over a million dollars, 1.1 million for that. Um, the three buses, a couple pieces of equipment, and our normal uh, preventive maintenance money for the, the work that we do, uh, oil changes and all the different stuff to the buses, uh, is about 600,000. So a total, it bumps it up a little bit to 1.7 million dollars this year that, that I'm asking for, again, through the the state and federal government or transportation administrations. And that's all due on Friday. I've got everything pretty much done except finalizing a few things to get that submitted. So that gives you a quick idea of, of where we're at and kind of what we're asking for this year. And, and uh, like I said, I just wanted to kind of update everybody on that. So right. any questions for yeah, questions, anybody? Maybe it was new to you, Ryan, so I wanted to welcome you and, and kind of update you a little bit. We, you know, just a quick side note, this, you know, public transportation is what we do through through Garrett Transit Service that is a, a Department of Community Action, but the money actually directly comes to the county. Paul has to sign all my paperwork for the grant and everything. It's, it's really not, you know, through community actions as such as it comes through the county and as the subrecipient of that money. So it's kind of, you know, we look at the public trans, uh, public transit side of it, you know, geared toward the entire county, more so than just stuff for community action, which we do head start and we do meals on wheels, but the, you know, the bigger 
umbrella is public transit for the entire county. So <clears throat> we try to you know get that out there that we we're available for everybody in the county, not only uh, community action clients and you know that that uh, class or certain people like that. So so anybody else? Anything else? No, that's it. Appreciate all you do, Mike. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank all right. you guys. Appreciate you. everything. Okay, thanks. All right, a couple of announcements. Uh, next scheduled public meeting will be Monday, April the 3rd, here at the courthouse at 4 o'clock. Uh, that day we will have budget presentations by the Health Department and the Board of Education. Uh, today, as soon as we adjourn the meeting, we'll have budget uh, presentations by the library and the state's attorney's office and potentially the sheriff's department. Uh, if you've been around Oakland today, you know they've had a busy afternoon. They may not be here today. Due to that, uh, we'll reschedule them if that uh, is the case. Uh, and then the meeting after that, there'll be another couple of uh, presentations as well. Uh, we're now at the conclusion of the meeting. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Before we go to the budget all right hearing none uh, do we have a motion to adjourn the meeting so moved. all right the public meeting is adjourned and at this time uh, Thomas I'll turn it over to you and we'll have the budget presentation for fiscal year 24 by the Ruth and Low Life <clears throat> uh, did you send them okay no I got them here for a minute <coughs> no, you can stay. It's a it's public. Yeah, you, you can, can go there. <laughs> so this is the uh, the the groups that we fund: the library, the health department, state's attorney's office. They come in and just give a an overview of their request, what their budgets are going to look like, justifications of why those budgets look the way that they look. Uh, it helps us when we build the budget, make decisions. Uh, but it, yeah, it's it's open to the public, and certainly <clears throat> everyone is welcome. See how stuff you <clears throat> we usually, we like to grill Thomas in particular. <laughs> the library is pretty brutal. Which one is it? <laughs> um, <laughs> all those books they got to <laughs> buy. And then it would be It worked. All right. All right. Mm. Thank you. So, I appreciate your time today. I'm, I'm here today, of course, to um, thank you for your support for the library and to give you a summary of what we've been up to um, since I saw you last. Uh, I want to thank my board members here for being so supportive and planning and uh, making it out today to help uh, back me up on this. So, thank you very much again. So, uh, first and foremost, um, you know, we've been working this last year to, to improve our uh, relationships with uh, the community. We take seriously our duty to use the resources that have been entrusted to us for the benefit of as many people as possible. And uh, we continue to develop our partnership in the schools, for instance. So we have classes visiting our facilities regularly from Crellin and Friendsville, and uh, we welcome the kids from Calvary Christian Academy as well. That's the, uh, on the right there, that's a Crellin visit. And our partnership with the school libraries now extends to all high and all middle schools in the county, which we're very happy about. Um, we continue to provide COVID test kits in partnership with the health department, and we look to help with their initiatives whenever possible. Uh, we're honored to be able to help with the county's 150th anniversary. And our friends of the library uh, funded uh, writer's workshops for children during the summer through Victoria and Chautauqua, and we're going to be doing that again this year. And uh, I had a lot of fun over the winter doing pub trivia in partnership with the Vagabond, of course. And uh, I plan to head back there in October. And um, we have another exciting project that's queued up that I can't really talk about quite yet, but I hope to announce soon. 
and our work with Maryland Legal Aid uh, continues and the Department of Social Services continues. We're proud to be able to connect people <coughs> excuse me, to legal resources um, and to legal advice and to assistance programs that can benefit them and help them make a difference, especially in uh, certain times like this. And uh, we plan to build on these partnerships in the near future. Um, we'll soon be holding a resource fair for the public that um, we're calling Support for Tomorrow. And uh, that brings a number of other agencies in simultaneously with these folks. And uh, one other thing to mention, with the reading station closing its doors, um, the library will do its best to take up the work that Sue Lasante has done so well for so long. And so we'll do our best to take up that gauntlet. And we've been able to add some new upgrades and resources on our website. We got a revamped catalog that uh, shows things a lot nicer than they did before, makes it a lot easier for folks to place holds. We have uh, access to Comics Plus, which is what it sounds like, and um, Udemy, which gives free classes on a variety of professional subjects. That's a very good pr um, uh, resource for professional development. And uh, we also have free Washington Post access, and all of this is made possible through our partnership with the Western Maryland Regional Library. And then, of course, there's the Friendsville Project, um, the <laughs> funds for which are now in the governor's budget uh, under the Maryland Library's Capital Grant Program. So with this grant, we will be able to move forward on formal planning in this next fiscal year in preparation for construction in fiscal year 25. But uh, as you know, things are still tough. And uh, as a result, we are respectfully requesting an increase to our budget this year. Inflation remains very high and uh, this increase would be used primarily to help the great people who work there meet the runaway costs of living. Um, you know, you ever read through the looking glass? I put that picture on there, you know, the Red Queen. Here we must run as fast as we can just to stay in place. And if you wish to go anywhere, you must run twice as fast as that. Um, but there's also a level of uncertainty this year with uh, regard to the budget. Um, in the legislative sphere, and we have to worry about that. Now, uh, as you know, the schedule for the minimum wage to change, you know, uh, is currently looking like that, as you see, but uh, it might change suddenly. There's a discussion about that. We've prided ourselves on being a year ahead of minimum wage increases, but the governor's current proposal would accelerate the $15 an hour minimum wage to the upcoming fiscal year. The requested increase would let us keep up, keep ahead of that. And then there's the Time to Care Act, which is also scheduled to take effect in October. Um, although they're talking about that right now, it might change, but we don't know. All employees will see their pay impacted by that, but the contributions that they're going to be required to make. And we, of course, have to meet our obligations there as well, but nobody knows yet just what the percentages are going to be. So we have to pay, but how much? We don't know. Although hopefully that will get worked out here. Apparently it's under discussion. But fortunately, libraries are a good investment for the community. Uh, every dollar you invested in the library returned $4.19 in services to the community this last fiscal year. Everything we do has a dollar value. And uh, we're real proud of that. 54% of this population are library members. Um, so that's about 15,856 active cards right now, at least as of uh, July 30th, and, or January 30th, June 30th, whatever, one of those J months. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but uh, we are very proud to be part of the social capital of a community. And uh, we want to make sure that we're uh, uh, connecting people to one another. That uh, the, the institutions that make a community resilient are things like the library that enable these sorts of connections, that enable pla people places to go during difficult times. And so we're anticipating difficult times and we're looking to be that place for folks. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're actively seeking their input now. Our strategic plan is ending. It's been five years. And uh, we're in the process of creating a new one. And so we want to make sure that we're doing the best job possible meeting the needs of folks. So we're going to be reaching out with surveys and focus groups and whatnot for anybody who wants to participate and let us know what they want their library to do these next five years because we want to meet those needs. And then. Um, so here's a few pictures. Over 100,000 people came through our doors last year. Uh, we made almost 1,200 new cards. Uh, as we get the word out about library resources and services, I'm always running around trying to 
you know, advertise what we do and what we can help folks with, and it seems to be working. And uh, <coughs> this reflects a significant year over year jump. We, we did 590 programs last year, and we had a total attendance of about 13,000, well, 13,738. And uh, that was, again, another big jump because people are, of course, returning from isolation and from COVID, and we're glad to be able to help reconnect them. We were able to give bikes away at the Friendsville Library thanks to a partnership we have with a local donor. And we're especially proud I always like to highlight a thousand books before kindergarten. We are especially proud to do that. Every single one of those wooden books represents a kid that their parents read a thousand books to. And there's a lot more than that that happened. Some of them haven't been carved yet. There's many of the other branches. But um, we're real proud of that. And someday we hope to see the wall line with them. We're on our way. And uh, I want to conclude with this video, if it will play. <laughs> which uh, was made possible by, again, our invaluable partners at the Western Railroad Regional Library. Let's cross our fingers. <laughs> Is it embedded? Yeah, it should be embedded as a YouTube okay. video. Maybe, hopefully. <coughs> if not, no great loss. Well, it's a loss. In the meantime, I'm happy to answer any questions you folks might have. Thomas, yes. um, I have a couple questions for you, but first I want to say thank you uh, for all that you do. Uh, it, it's noticeable the impact the libraries have on the communities. Uh, just what you were talking about with Friendsville, I know what you're doing in Grantsville, my kids down there all the time. Uh, okay. you, you do a great job and I just want to publicly say thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, on the on the budget stuff, um, how many total employees do you have? We have 27 total employees. And how many of them are salaried? Uh, how many of them are minimum wage employees? Let's see here. We have two Roughly. minimum wage employees left. Um, uh, most of the others are a bit over that. Again, we're trying to stay ahead of the jump. So um, mo we have two that are will be under 15 currently. Um, some of them, a lot of them are a bit over 15, and that's about it. And then um, we have uh, all, you know, three of the four of the branch managers are full time. Um, one is part. It, it just I'd have to get back to you about the. Exact I was just concern. curious to how that minimum wage increase yeah. might affect you directly yeah well it will directly affect two but then you know again it ripples up because sure. the ones that aren't are just above it right so and with the friendsville library mm -hmm. uh which i know we've been working on for years and it's been a, a big project of yours uh at one point in time there was some talk of working with the school and maybe trying to combine some resources there to help with this situation down there uh did that fall through? Where are we at with that? Is that off the table? Um, well, what can you tell us about that? Sure. Um, I'm happy to discuss it with the school. The main issue is money. And it's the notion that I have the money for this project now. I don't have the money for building in the school's area because the school's in a floodplain. I've actually brought it up with the state and said, hey, would this uh, proposal work for a joint use facility within this existing building? And they said, yeah, we're not going to give you money for building in a floodplain. Okay. That's kind of what it boils down to. Right. I'm happy to talk to them. Right. I'm just curious because that was out there and of course everybody knows the situation with the schools. And yeah. You know, everybody's looking to try to come up with some solutions. But and with that in mind, I also you know, kind of view the library project in Friendsville is a potential economic stimulus for the community. So. Any other questions for Thomas about the library? All right, thank you, sir. Thank Appreciate you. it. Appreciate thank it. You. All right, Christian, you're up, buddy. Well, hard to follow Thomas. Thanks, <laughs> This is your first uh, yes. shindig in your new role. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I think I've had the opportunity to meet everybody here uh, in one way or the other. Um, so thank you for having me today. 
Uh, I know obviously very, uh, very busy, um, but I'm excited to speak to you about the state's attorney's office, what we're doing, um, where we want to go with some things. Um, so I've been a prosecutor myself um, for about 10 years, combination of between mostly here in Garrett County, but uh, also previously in Frederick County. Um, so I have a little bit of perspective both uh, from within this office and also from a, you know, a larger office, different scale, uh, different approach. Uh, so part of, um, part of what I want to talk to you guys about is that, uh, you know, we all love Garrett County. We love it for different reasons. We, we know what a special place it is. Uh, and when people think about why they love Garrett County, they might express it differently. Some people might talk about, um, you know, being able to walk across the street to their library uh, with their kids, or maybe you're thinking about Friday night, Southern Northern, or your church community. Uh, but whatever the reasons are that people say that why we love Garrett County so much, uh, an assumption that we always have in the background is that it's a, a very safe and secure community. Uh, and I, I think that's true that people, uh, people know, they trust their neighbors, uh, and they, they view it as a very safe community. So, our office obviously takes that very seriously. Uh, what we want to do is continue and maintain that quality of life uh, that's part of the background. I think that our constituents expect that as well. Uh, people care about crime. Uh, they care that it's addressed. Uh, and I believe what, what our community expects is that there's uh, accountability for crime, uh, that it is, uh, cases are prosecuted in a fair way, uh, and that also there is a thoughtful approach to sentencing so that you both have accountability for crimes, that people know that uh, there are consequences, but also that we're trying to address the problems in the community. We think about mental health issues, substance abuse issues, to try to make it better going forward uh, because we, we do want to safeguard our communities. So our office, uh, obviously we have a lot of different responsibilities uh, in terms of prosecution. Uh, we have two courts operating pretty much at all times, the district court and the circuit court. Uh, the district court has a full-time prosecutor. We've recently been able to uh, fortunately hire a veteran prosecutor, Mary Burnell, uh, somebody I knew from Cecil County uh, who has a lot of experience. Uh, right now, uh, those cases are primarily, we're looking at serious traffic cases, uh, DUI type offenses, uh, domestic violence cases, uh, misdemeanor drug cases, property crimes. Uh, so that is a, a very busy docket over there across the street. Uh, the circuit court up here, we have everything from uh, felony, uh, child, physical and sexual abuse cases, uh, violent crimes, felony drug offenses, uh, burglaries and more serious property crimes. There's also a juvenile docket uh, every other week. So plenty going on. Um, the unfortunate thing about being a small county is even though some of the absolute numbers are smaller, we don't have a different variety of cases. We still have these courts operating uh, that we have to go uh, be in court doing these things. We want to be prepared to do the uh, do all those things uh, and be adequately prepared and trained. So, you know, I'll get right to it. I'm not going to hide any ball here. Uh, I believe that our office is significantly understaffed, uh, that we have been for some time. Uh, although we are not the smallest county in the state, we don't have the smallest amount of crime in the state. We do have the smallest state's attorney's office. Uh, you can see, and some of this is, uh, this is all public source data off the governor's office of uh, crime uh, control and prevention. Uh, mostly 2019 data, because that's the most recent data that's pre, there's 2020 data, but it's kind of jacked up, so to speak, because of COVID. Uh, so this is mostly 2019 data, the most recent reliable year, really. Uh, you can see we have two and a half full-time prosecutors. Uh, we have uh, two full-time prosecutors, uh, including the uh, elected or appointed state's attorney, and then a part-time person. That part-time person uh, has announced that they intend on retiring here uh, in the coming months. So this would be, I think, a logical time for us to transition that position to a full-time position. Uh, you can see the number of, um, if you go to the next slide, uh, Kevin, the next slide will show you our total caseload and total uh, criminal caseload per prosecutor. You can see uh, some people say, you know, some of my, my in-laws say, oh, nothing happens up in Garrett County. You know, uh, that's obviously not true. Uh, we do have uh, proportionately for a lot of reasons, 
it, it is not the lowest crime rate, the, not the lowest number of cases in absolute terms either. So you can see both, uh, the critical one is criminal caseload per prosecutor, uh, we're well above the average there, and well above the average in total caseload. A couple factors, you might be wondering, well, I don't, I don't see these cases, that seems uh, outrageous. We are affected, and we're similar to Worcester County in this way, in that we have this fairly small year-round population, but we do have, uh, we can't ignore that there are seasonal uh, fluctuations. A lot of great things about that. Uh, love the tax base and, and want to cultivate that, but it is a fact that there is uh, an increase in, uh, in criminal, some criminal activity. Uh, I'm not saying these are organized gangs coming in, but particularly you'll see uh, alcohol-related driving offenses. You do see a number of D, a DUI increase, uh, and you, you do see, uh, because what do people do on vacation? They drink. Uh, you do see that there is an increase in some domestic violence cases. Uh, just because those people aren't from here, they're from Pittsburgh or Baltimore, D.C., wherever, uh, we still have to deal with those cases and do, do so in an appropriate way. So much like Worcester County, uh, on maybe a little smaller scale, we're affected by some of those trends. So that's part of what would explain uh, maybe that little a little higher than average uh, uh, criminal, uh, criminal occurrence than we would otherwise expect. We've also had some challenges that uh, the state has sort of mandated. Um, you guys have heard uh, several times, mostly from the Sheriff's Department, about body-worn cameras. Uh, that is something that for various national political reasons was required, uh, mainly in order to increase transparency with the idea of some um, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to characterize them, but uh, some very unfortunate national, high-profile issues. Uh, whether people agree or disagree with it, that's the law of Maryland now. That these law enforcement agencies are required to have body-worn cameras. Uh, fortunately, we're not waiting until the last minute. Uh, our sheriff's office has been getting ahead of things on that, uh, so they have rolled out uh, sort of a trial program. They're going to be increasing that uh, slowly. The state police is already required to do it uh, as of, uh, I believe, July 1st of last year. Or, I'm sorry, July 1st of this year, but they've already got it. Uh, so all of our state troopers have body-worn cameras. Uh, a, couple, a couple results of this. One, there was obviously a cost to, uh, to the state and to the county, anyone who operates these law enforcement agencies. There's a cost in terms of the hardware itself. There's a cost in terms of the software packages in order to maintain it. Uh, you've also heard from, uh, when, when Lisa Thayer Welch spoke to you last year, about uh, that for the, uh, the prosecutors to be able, we, we end up being the custodians of this at some point, and we're required by law to provide all this to defense attorneys. It's evidence in cases. Uh, we are legally and ethically obligated to provide that to them. With that, there's also other laws where, you know, these videos pick up everything uh, that's happening on the scene of the crime. There are confidentiality rules where, you know, if there's a child in the background, if people are giving personal information or identifying information, a domestic violence victim could be sharing where they plan to go when they, uh, when they flee this violence. There's a lot of things that we're required to redact. We have somebody, uh, I want to thank the commissioners for uh, funding a support staff position uh, where we, we have been very fortunate to fill that. Uh, Mr. Carter's been doing an excellent job the past six months. Um, we are hopeful to continue to efficiently be able to do that. Um, Allegheny County, for example, is, is seeking to add a number, a number of positions. Worcester County, about twice our population, they added six additional support staff positions to deal with this and six additional attorneys. Different things going on there, but uh, the body-worn cameras have a significant effect on the prosecutor's office because we need to process that. Uh, we need to redact the videos and be able to provide it to the defense attorney or we lose the case. Um, we're also, the prosecutor himself uh, is required to review that. Eth it makes sense ethically. We, if, if we're going to be prosecuting someone for a crime, we have to actually watch the video, review the video to be able to go forward in good faith. Um, so that obviously takes, uh, is additional time on what I would suggest to you uh, is already, uh, I, would, I would call us hardworking. That's a positive spin on it. Uh, that our prosecutors uh, have traditionally been very hard working in this county. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to be very familiar with our night custodial staff here, uh, but uh, the 
frankly, we're just at capacity uh, already in terms of what we're able to handle. Uh, last week, we had grand jury. Uh, we had a jury trial for a child sex case. Um, there was district court going on. Law enforcement agencies are calling. We interact with them on a regular basis, giving them advice, reviewing search warrants, and sort of managing the investigation. Um, so what I'm asking the county to do is to consider, um, re really to just consider that it's not, uh, I don't want you to take my anecdotal statement that, oh, we're overworked or, um, you know, we could do more. Uh, the sort of the objective data that you have here is that the caseload per prosecutor, uh, we are, we're significantly above average. Uh, but that aside from that, the scale of the county makes it very difficult for us to do all the things we can do, we, that we should be doing. Um, it's, it's just simple math. If you have two people and there are two courts and you have other things coming up, you need to interact with law enforcement agencies uh, or consider if somebody became ill or pregnant or wanted to go to training. Um, wanted to, to get better at their job in some way. Those things are extremely, they, they're not very disruptive if you're in Frederick County and there's 27 prosecutors. You can have three people out. But if you have one person out in Garrett County, it is extremely disruptive and it's, uh, you know, your house is on fire time. So uh, a couple things that I would like to do with the office in the next couple of years. One, we're also the only county in the office that doesn't have case management software. Uh, what that is, it's just what it sounds like. It's software to collect, bring together data, uh, to coordinate between uh, the Maryland Electronic Courts platform, uh, between different law enforcement agencies, and between our internal documents so that we can have one sort of central hub, uh, if you will, where uh, support staff and investigators are working in and out of to bring documents to be able to file things with the court. It'll make us a little more efficient. Um, we're, uh, you know, we've gotten along this long, obviously doing Microsoft Word. Uh, I think we got rid of a typewriter last year. Uh, so we're, we're happy to do all that. But when we, uh, if we can be a little bit more efficient with some of these things, it'll free up time to be focusing on assessing cases, meeting with victims, speaking with the police, uh, and trying to ensure good outcomes. So it's, we believe that's something the community cares about. They care about crime. Uh, and our community deserves, uh, deserves the full attention of our prosecutors. So what I'm asking for, um, a, a couple things I would like to do. In the next, I'm not asking for the commissioners to fund, at this time, case management software. What I would like to do is I'd like to pursue uh, a couple uh, grant funding opportunities uh, because I guess I hate myself, I want to write another grant. Um, but I want to go uh, pursue these grant funding opportunities to be able to collect that data. Um, that data is uh, invaluable when, unfortunately, it's a chicken and egg thing. When you're trying to write a grant, you need data. You need to be able to say, this is, this is the data that we have. This is the problem we want to address. So uh, I very much want to pursue those opportunities so that we can be efficient, not, if we can, not have the county uh, put out the bill for these software programs, which are, are rather expensive, I will tell you. Uh, what I do think is long overdue, and the, the big ask that I'm making of the county, uh, is that ideally, when you look at some of those numbers, I think this is a county that would ideally be served by full, four full-time prosecutors. Uh, that would require the county to ultimately add one and a half positions. Uh, so if you have the half person retiring at this time, uh, you would be adding at some point two full-time positions. Uh, I think that would logically give us the ability to have a juvenile and sex abuse prosecutor uh, that we would have a uh, we would come more into proportion here when you look at the prosecutor for population uh, we would be more in tune or proportionate with what the rest of the rest of the state is at um, I'm very proud of our office uh, if I invite any of you to come visit us I don't think you'll be um, you'll be overwhelmed with the accommodations uh, we're not asking you for a cappuccino maker uh, anything like that, but I am very proud of our staff. I think we have very hardworking people from all over the county, uh, and I believe that uh, if we come into uh, into proportion with where the rest of the state uh, has funded prosecutors, I think we can have very good results, uh, and I think it's something that the community uh, expects and will see the results of. So, 
I want to ask, uh, ask you respectfully to consider that. Thank you for your consideration that over the next, uh, ideally we would like uh, at least one of those full-time positions at this point. Uh, I understand uh, and appreciate that the three of you are careful stewards of our taxpayer money. Uh, sometimes it's best to grow slow, uh, but I think um, it is long overdue uh, that we have a third full-time prosecutor, and I think we'd be well served by a fourth. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys might have about the office, uh, our attempts at modernizing uh, anything that we're doing. Any questions? Not Christian, uh, clerical staff, uh, how many... Uh, what do you have there? <clears throat> so yeah, we have um, we have three people that you might say are support staff or clerical staff. Uh, we have um, case managers or office managers, uh, both in the district court division and in the circuit court division. And then we have one, um, one young lady who both uh, serves as a victim witness advocate that we're required to have by state law and is also a paralegal as well. So she has kind of wears a couple of different hats. So we, in addition to that, we have three, uh, three investigators so one in the circuit court, one in the district court, and uh, our evidence technician, who he does the, the video, dealing with the body cam video, redacting that, sending that out. If I may, just some yes, clarification. Sir. Yes. Sir. So you want one new position, you have two and a half, you're losing the half, so you need a, technically a half a position? Yeah, so, um, and I don't, uh, this is this is probably more of a Scott kind of yeah, question, but yeah, kind of so we would want to convert that that part-time <clears throat> position okay. to a full-time position and then at some point add an additional right. full-time okay. prosecutor. I just want to clarify that for you. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly Thank right. Thank you. Um, and that is something that um, there's been a big trend nationally away from part-time prosecutors. Um, part of national prosecution standards is that it should be avoided if possible. Um, a lot of reasons include attracting talent, uh, they become less attractive positions. Uh, also, it, it, does, it is a little prone to conflicts of interest. If you have somebody who has a civil practice uh, and they say, well, I'm getting paid by the government to work Tuesday and Wednesday, but I, who's my priority is my divorce client. You know? So there is a, uh, we don't have that issue, fortunately, with our, our part-time prosecutor currently, but um, it, is, it is not considered the best practice to have part-time prosecutors, I'll say that. All right. Any other questions? Gentlemen, I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And uh, as mentioned before this, uh, the Sheriff's Department could not be here today. They're dealing with other issues and concerns, so we will reschedule them. Next meeting, we will hear from the Health Department and the Board of Education. With that, the meeting's all been ready, been adjourned. Thank you all for coming, and uh, we'll see you in two weeks.